He teaches environmental history and the history of science and the United States Human History for UC Davis. He also held a postdoc in geography at UC Berkeley. Um, his research is focused on several topics, including climate change, natural disasters, uh, mountaineering, water, and um, he's written most extensively on the Peruvian Andes, particularly in his book, In the Shadow of Melting Glaciers, Climate Change in Andean Society, which was published in 2010 by Oxford. Um, and it won the Eleanor Melville Prize for the best book in Latin American environmental history. And um, one of his articles, The History of Ice, How Glaciers Became an Endangered Species, won the Leopold Heidi Prize for the best article in the Journal of Environmental History. So again, thanks for everybody for coming. This is great. And I hope we do get a good chance, like Anita said at the beginning, to have a lot of dialogue and discussion. I really like this format, so I hope how it works. It all depends on all of you chiming in. So, um, and along those lines, what I want to do is, um, is to raise, I want to talk about issues of um, glacier retreat and water supplies in the Andes and bring in a historical perspective on that. Um, but I'm also going to be raising some questions that I actually have not finished sorting out in my head. And those are really about how can human history and scientific modeling, quantitative modeling, possibly come together. And what I'm going to be arguing is that we actually we really need to bring them together somehow. But I, I don't know the answer to that. So um, it, it seems pretty tricky to try to, to pull those two things together. So I'm going to focus on the Andes. This is um, um, the area that I've been working for, for quite a while. So I'll jump in there with a case study. But quick, just some overview here of why do we care about glaciers? Why do glaciers matter in terms of water supply? Um, we have lots of glaciers in lots of mountain ranges with um, millions and millions of people. Um, this is actually probably an underestimate. Some people push this number up to one and a half or two million people and um, get it up really high. But um, there's a lot of water that comes out of these glaciers. And so the concern is that as the glaciers melt and, and shrink, I should say they're always melting pretty much, but as they shrink, then there'll be a lot less water for people to use. So the Andes, this is where I'm going, uh, and this is particularly concerned, a particular concern there because it's so dry. And in the summer months, as you can see, um, but it's really the summer dry period, uh, which is really roughly May until September. That's when glaciers are really providing a significant portion of the water is coming out. And so this is a big concern. Not only that, but when you think about 70 or 80 percent of the of the energy in the countries coming from hydroelectricity, you absolutely need water in, in these rivers to be running to produce hydroelectricity. The particular range that I'll focus on here for a little bit is the Cordillera Blanco or the White Mountains. Um, and this is a, a this is the most glaciated tropical uh, mountain range in the tropics. Um, this, these numbers are changing by the minute, but that's um, some of the, the recent evidence of the recent size of them. And about 400,000 people would live in the watershed of this Santa River. And you can see it here, the headwaters up in this area, and it flows north and then cuts through a very steep canyon here at Camion del Pato, and this is a hydroelectric facility right here, and then it comes down and empties into the Pacific Ocean. So that's, that's the, the Cordillera Blanca. As I mentioned, the Santa River and all these rivers is providing a lot of uh, dry season runoff, but also the annual flow. 10 to 20 percent of the annual flow comes from glaciers, is the estimate. Um, and in the dry season, that can shoot up to 66 percent. Now, this is for the Santa watershed. It gets complicated because as soon as you go into the sub watersheds off of, off of the Santa, it really depends on how big it is, what the soil is like, what percentage of glaciation there is in that watershed. So these are, these are kind of broad. Um, statement. If you're a hydrologist, you cringe at this broad statement, so that's why I just mentioned there's a lot more going on um, as, you, as you leave the sun. So there's lots of water that comes from the glaciers, goes down into the rivers, um, and then you look at this kind of a slope here for what's happening with glaciers over the last, well, this is just since 1930, it could extend up to 1860 or 1870 when the last, when the Little Ice Age ended in the 19th century. Glaciers have been in retreat since then, and accelerating a little bit in the last 20, 30 years. So if you're getting a lot of water from the glaciers, and the glaciers are shrinking so much, this is where the concerns come about. And this is now what people have predicted. So these are some of the models that are saying that if we take some of the IPCC climate scenarios and project those out, what are we looking at in terms of reduction of, of water based on climate change and ensuing glacier shrinkage? And so you get a variation in these models. 
Uh, the first one is to be coming out, we're looking at 21 to 23 percent by 2050, 2080, so a bit into the future. Um, Barrer and, and some others have recently done another study saying that actually this, this shrinkage has already started, and so and some others are saying that from 1954 to 1997, we've already seen a 17% reduction in the, in the water supply, um, and we're looking at a 30% decline with no glaciers. Now, we hear in the news all the time that glaciers are going to vanish, and many will, but the, and that happens for the Cordillera Blanca, that, those statements, but I would say that's going to be a couple centuries away, so that's not um, too impending, yet those are pretty significant numbers to, to talk about the water reduction. So, so you have these kind of models, worries about glacier retreat. Those that are um, kind of translated or projected out into how much hydroelectricity you're going to use, uh, lose, I should say. So this is one study that's, that's often cited here, is that if you have a 50% reduction in the glacier runoff, you'll have 11%, roughly 11% less of hydroelectricity generation. This then, these kind of scenarios lead people to put up this statement here about climate changes, you get smaller glaciers, then you have less water or no water, and then you have less hydroelectricity. This is a journalist, Mark Linus, I don't know if maybe some of you have read some of his work before, but um, he comes out with this very strong statement here that, um, that if the glaciers disappear, there'll be uh, no water supply for six months of every year, life will quickly become impossible. The massive majority of Lima, this is a eight, city of eight million people, um, Lima's population have already, already have difficulty accessing, with, accessing reliable water supply and have to be forced to move or die. This is a scenario that's painted very often. And this is what I want to now spend the rest of my talk challenging and saying that this is a really problematic, misleading way to think about climate change. And so what I want to do is turn and say I, the big problem with this is history. Remember, there's been a 17% reduction in water supply since 1954, at least. If there's a reduction in water supply, there should be an ensuing reduction of water use. That's, or at least the ability to use that water. That's the implied intent of a lot of the, of the modeled results, and especially the way they're picked up by the media and environmental groups and NGOs and different things. So that's what I want to uh, raise some questions about. So let's, let's think about a couple examples here of what's happened over the last 60 years or so with water use as these glaciers have been shrinking and then the water supplies have gone down. Well, we could look at megawatts here of electricity generated on the Santa River, primarily from the Canyon del Pato hydroelectric station. It's Peru's seventh largest, so it's a pretty good sized one. Uh, and you can see before 1958, before it existed, they were producing no energy, of course. And then every few years, it seems like they add a little bit um, this first effort in the 1950s was really, uh, if you were to know history and know this period of import, substitution, industrialization, where Latin American countries were turning inside and really investing in their own countries, this was more of a political economic decision to do this project and build it, modeled after the Tennessee Valley Authority, and that's what really got it running. In 2001, this last big boost was part of a neoliberal structural adjustment that privatized the hydroelectric company in 1997, sold it to Duke Energy um, from the East Coast, and then they had lots of capital and could therefore um, significantly increase the amount of electricity produced. But these are political and economic um, decisions about how much megawatts are being produced, how many megawatts. Um, and you can also see that they're almost doubled the amount of water that they're taking out of the Santa River and using. At the same time they're doing that, downstream farther than that, they're not taking all the water out because downstream you have this tremendous growth in, um, in irrigation. And a lot of this is export-led, uh, export-oriented um, agriculture. And you can see a dramatic increase here, 7,500 hectares to 174,000 hectares over time. And we get some of the major crops here. Peru is now skyrocketed in the world to be one of the big producers of asparagus, avocados, um, and artichokes. And so you can see this. Remember, we're talking here, this is water. They're using irrigated, irrigation water from the Santa River while the water supply is going down and glaciers are shrinking over the last half century. They've increased these amounts. So when we see that, that simple kind of a graph, which is not to say that the graph of water decline and glacier retreat 
It's not to say that that is wrong, it's just to say that when we actually bring in people and the human use, the scenario gets really different. And what I would say that most succinctly is water use and water su um, supply really get conflated too often, and we really need to think about those two and how they intersect. One other example here would be uh, potable water use in the cities up in the upper mountain areas. This is a picture of Wadasa, that's one city. And you can just, I'm not going to spend much time just to say you can see that their populations have been growing in these urban areas and they're increasingly supplying more and more water. So, um, so they keep using more and more. So uh, this is to say, as I just mentioned, water use is much more about the politics, the economics, and the cultural values. This is a picture of a group of campesinos and local people who took over this big reservoir from Duke Energy in 2009. They went up to it, seized control, and, and are still in negotiations. It's still not resolved um, three and a half years later now um, what's going to happen to this reservoir. So um, they reacted because of the power struggle. They felt like it was this gringo North American company who was coming and stealing their water. Um, that, it turns out Duke was complying with the law on everything that they had, but it was, just became a very complicated issue with a lot of culture, uh, cultural values embedded in what was happening and how people were, were reacting. So when we look downstream, we get a variety of, of drivers of water use or factors influencing it with technology, how big the turbines are, how many irrigation canals you have, all of that. We also have the institution and the laws supporting that. I talked about with neoliberalism or import substitution um, efforts, those would be economic agendas and opportunities. It's also environmental factors, of course, that are at play here, how, how much water there actually is. If you take away 100% of the water, of course, you can't do any of these things. So the physical environment still matters, culture and the social context, <coughs> inequality, real and perceived. So, so you get all these different factors that are playing out there. I'm just using the Andes as a case study. Um, lots of these same issues are playing out right now in the Himalayas as well. There's been really dire statements over the last decade about, well, it seems like it used to be a couple hundred thousand, a couple hundred million people were affected by glacier runoff, then it went up towards a billion. I just saw a news article this week saying 1.5 billion people are affected by um, glacier runoff in the Himalayas. The number keeps just getting exaggerated more and more and more. At the same time, the National Academy of Sciences just in October released a new report on this saying that downstream, it's really monsoons that are affecting how much water there are in the rivers like the Yellow and the Yangtze and the Ganges, these other huge rivers. It's not so much about the glacier retreat and the glacier runoff. In the upper sections, absolutely, it depends on that. So it's just a, it's a lot more complicated what we're learning about this in the simple equation. I would say the same thing in the Northwest. We could be thinking about these issues here. The glaciers are still providing um, some water and some hydroelectricity in the region, so, so these issues could play out here as well. Any place where there's mountains and glaciers, these issues matter. So the, the question I'm, I would be asking then and, and throwing out to everybody is, should, should these human variables be put into models? Would the models looking out 20, 30, 50, 100 years would they look differently if we had some kind of human factors in there? And if we were looking at issues like, well, there's going to be a change in government every 20 years, therefore that's going to change water supply. There's going to be a social revolution every 40 years. And uh, should we be adding these kind of things? I don't know. Most historians would say this is horrendous. You can't predict the future with history. You can't simplify and quantify history. That's not allowed. On the other hand, I do feel like it's pretty detached from humans when we do these kind of um, assessments about and projections for what's going to happen in the future. I mean, these are just based on scenarios, but I think we could bring in the people quite a bit more. So I'm, I'm really asking this question about people, human history and models, but also raising questions about how we're thinking about climate change and whether it's too environmentally deterministic, whether we're you know, not collaborating enough between different fields, and whether it's too separated, and really just in the broadest way asking us to be rethinking um, the way we think about climate change and mountain environments in general. So um, I'll just end with, uh, I just want to acknowledge some of my collaborators, National Science Foundation for funding on this, and some of the collaborators um, that I've been working with on this as well. So. So thanks very much for listening. We'll pass it over, and hopefully we'll come back to this in, in a while. Okay, thanks.